friends of Jehovah, if we're to have hope of everlasting life, we will have need of endurance. Now, there's no question about our living in the time of the end. We have plenty of proof of that. We have historical proof and chronological proof in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. In fact, much of this prophecy is recorded in Matthew 24, and maybe for a moment you'd like to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. The Bible foretold for the time of the end an increase in lawlessness, an increase in disease, foretold families breaking up, and many, many other things that we have seen with our own eyes during this time. But when we see the things foretold for the time of the end, the increase in lawlessness, the problems with health, increased problems with health, families breaking up, when you see these things foretold for the time of the end, do these events stir you so that you see the need to exert yourself to endure knowing that we live in the time of the end, and if there's any time to endure, it's now when we're so close to the end of this system of things. In Matthew 24, look at verse 12. It says, Because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many would cool off. You know what that means? That means that a lot of people would quit enduring. But look at verse 13. It says, He that has endured to the end is the one that will be saved. We want to be among those who endure and receive God's gift of salvation. And that's why we're talking this morning about the importance of maintaining endurance as Job and other faithful men did. Now, while we talk about this matter this morning, none of us should think that this counsel does not apply to us. Because in the Bible, there are repeated reminders to endure. Many of you here this morning may have been in Jehovah's service for many, many years. Some of you here this morning may have been in the truth for a shorter period of time. Whether you've been in the truth for a long time or a short time, I'm sure that all of you have met and overcome a number of trials of endurance. And you can be sure that Jehovah has observed and Jehovah has approved the course you have followed up to now. But it's one matter to start out in a course of Christian endurance. It's quite another matter to continue forever in such a course of endurance. Would you like to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10? Here the Apostle Paul wrote something to Hebrew Christians in the first century that gives us something to think about. Now, in Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 32, Paul wrote those Hebrew Christians and said, However, keep on remembering the former days in which, after you were enlightened, you endured a great contest under suffering. So he invited them to remember when they were first in the truth. The way he put it, the former days, after you were first enlightened, you endured a great contest under suffering. And it may be that many of you, when you first learned the truth, ran into a heap of problems. Opposition from relatives, from friends, from mates at work. Many, when they first learn, in, learn the truth, run into many problems. But whatever problems you ran into when you first got acquainted with the truth, you've overcome those problems. You've endured them. The reason we know is because you're still here this morning. But now that you've been in the truth for a while, in verse 39, Paul says, Now we are not the sort that shrink back to destruction, but the sort that have faith to the preserving alive of the soul. So this matter of endurance is a continuing thing. No matter what you've endured up to now, there is a need to continue enduring if you will receive God's gift of life and salvation. Now, the Bible writer James pointed to the faithful man Job as an example of endurance. And perhaps you'd like to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5, verse 11. There's a verse here that many of you are acquainted with. In James, the Bible writer says, Look, 
We pronounce happy those who have endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and seen the outcome Jehovah gave, that Jehovah is very tender and affection and merciful. Now here, James points to Job as an example of endurance. When you read this verse, some of you may react mentally and say, why talk about Job? Job lived such a long time ago. And it's true. Job lived a long time ago. But in our consideration of Job this morning, you're going to find that the problems Job faced are the same problems you and I face, or the same problems we may face. And within our consideration this morning, we can figure out what helped Job to endure these problems. We may get some clues as to what will help us endure the same problems if we should run into them. Now, this morning in our consideration, we're going to talk basically about three situations. We're going to talk about problems with help. We're going to talk about problems that come from members of your own family and friends. And we're going to talk about problems that come as a result of the loss of material possession. Now, in this matter of health first, I think all of you can appreciate that it could be a very severe test of endurance if we should experience a loss of health, a painful disease, a physical handicap. It could be quite a test of our endurance. Now, the Bible shows that Satan contended that if Job were to suffer physically, if Job were plagued with disease, Job would quit enduring and curse God. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that a man or a woman should quit serving God and quit enduring because he has problems with his health? Or on the other side of the picture, do you believe a man or a woman ought to be able to endure disease and illness without blaming God? The Bible shows that with God's permission, the devil caused Job to have the disease that many people today call elephantiasis. Now, what it is, it's a skin disease. And it's very painful. And it's marked with boils and swelling and ulcers and skin eruptions. If you'd like to read a little description of what Job had, turn in your Bible to Job chapter 2, verse 7. In Job chapter 2, verse 7, it says, So Satan went out away from the person of Jehovah and struck Job with a malignant boil from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Have you ever had boils? If you've ever had boils, you know what this is talking about. If you get boils, what happens is you begin to get a swelling in a certain spot, and it spreads, and then it starts to raise, and it comes to a nasty little white knot on top. And it makes it so sore you couldn't possibly touch anywhere around it. If you've ever had boils, you know what I'm talking about. But can you imagine a man having boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot? He could never stand on the thing. If you've had boils, you know what that's all about. Now, that's one description of what Job had. Would you like to read Job's description of what he had? Turn to Job chapter 7, verse 5. In Job 7, verse 5, Job said, My flesh has become clothed with maggots, that little worm, and lumps of dust, my skin itself has formed crust, or it was scabby and dissolved. So what did Job have? He had open, oozing sores, full of pus, with little maggots around in there trying to eat out the pus. If you want it in one short sentence, Job was a mess. Can you imagine yourself in a situation like that? I'll tell you, it wouldn't be pleasant. It wouldn't be pleasant at all. Now, you and I may not be special test cases like Job was, but the fact remains we may suffer disease. And our disease may be very painful. It may be crippling, and it may be a very great test of your endurance. 
Now, peop when people have problems with health, the big question that always comes up is why. Why did it happen to me? Now, this morning, instead of me doing all the talking, I'd like to ask you some questions and get your expression on this. When people have problems with their health, is it because Jehovah's to blame? All of us know from our study of the Bible that's not the reason. Jehovah doesn't strike people with problems with their health. Okay, then the question comes up, why do people have problems with health? If you have problems with health, the question is always why. Now, there are a lot of different answers to this question. Suppose you give me one reason why people have problems with health and see how many we can name in just a minute or two. Go to back here. Imperfection is the big reason why people have problems with their health. We're imperfect and we just haven't got the ability inside of ourselves to face disease. Now that's the big reason why we have problems with health. What are some other reasons? Brother here, please. Pollution is a big problem, sister, please. Yes. Sometimes from our parents we've inherited something. No fault of our own, but it's a weakness. We have problems. Brother? Yes, it may be. Some of us are not careful with what we eat. Some of us don't get the nourishment we need. Just to add a few others. Some of us don't get the sleep we need either. Kind of burn the candle at both ends and then you're really worn out and you're exposed to something and you haven't got the physical ability to fight it. And as the brother said, some of us don't breathe the, be the best air, not through any fault of our own, it's just where we live. And some of the foods are not as nourishing as they might be under better conditions. So there are a lot of different reasons why we have problems with health and we appreciate that. But there are some other reasons too. You know, we live in a world where we're surrounded by imperfect people. And we live in a world that is full of disease and infection. Now you personally may have a very good standard of hygiene. Maybe you're careful to get the sleep you need. Maybe you're careful about the food you eat and your own cleanliness. But we live in a world surrounded by imperfect and diseased people. Now, just as an example of what can happen, let's say you go out shopping. And you go into one of these big supermarkets where you have to push the door, you've got to grab the handle to go in. Now, who went through that door 10 seconds before you? You don't know, do you? And how infected he was. And what did he leave on that door jam? And you come through and with your hand you push it. And whatever he left on there, you pick it up. And then you get in the store and your eye at you, so you go, and what germs did you just put in the opening of your eye? Well, let's say you're a youngster and you go to school. Let's say your school has two stories, and you go from the first floor to the second during a break in your classes, and you go down the banister, and how many hundred kids went down that banister, and what kind of infection did they leave on that banister? Now, let's say you don't have a two-story school, but just one, and you come into your next class, and the desk is all full of erasure uh, scraps and dust, and you get all the stuff off, and then the teacher says, now we'll turn to page 15, and to turn the page, you go, <laughs> and you lick your finger to turn the page, and what did you just lick off your finger? Yeah. We live in a world where we're surrounded by sick and diseased people. And despite our best effort, we become exposed to disease and infection that we never planned on. So there are a lot of reasons why people get sick and have problems with their health. God isn't to blame for it. We're to blame for a lot of it. Some of it we've inherited. Some of it we blame other people for. Rather than blaming God, we can thank God that he's told us about the new system of things and it won't be long before sick people get, begin to get well. But the fact still remains that you and I may suffer a loss of health. It may be because of old age. Some of us may get cancer. Some of us may get polio or other diseases. And it may be a very great test of your endurance. And frankly, it may be very depressing to you when you have problems with health. 
But I'd like to say, if you have problems with depression, it does not prove you're going out of the truth. It proves you're human. Some of you here in the Kingdom Hall may have been acquainted with Brother McMillan. Brother McMillan was in the truth for a long time, 40, 50, 60 years. He traveled all over the country giving talks, and many were well acquainted with him for that reason. About the last 10 years of his life, Brother McMillan ended up at Bethel. And Brother McMillan was one of the anointed. The man was a pillar spiritually. He was always a radiantly happy man. Anybody who knew him knows that he was that kind of a person. And yet, during the last few years of his life, Brother McMillan had problems with health. And you know what he said? He said, it has been a real test on me in recent years, not being able to be as active in the Lord's work as I used to be. He said, I have a constant fight with discouragement. Now, can you imagine that? from one of the Lord's anointed, a man who is a pillar spiritually, and he admitted he had a constant fight with discouragement. So you get discouraged sometimes? Don't be too upset over it. It just proves you're normal and human, nothing else. But the fact remains we may have problems with health, and if we do, what are we going to do about it? Job endured his problems with health, and at the same time, Job spoke to God's honor. The Bible told about three fellows that moved in to see Job. They called themselves friends, but the Bible says that they called, caused Job more trouble than they did him good. And despite the false accusations that those three fellows leveled against Job when he was sick, you read the Bible account and Job kept on speaking to God's honor. And you know what? No matter what problems we have, if we wish to, we can speak to God's honor too. You may know brothers and sisters. You may know brothers and sisters who have had prolonged problems with their health. And still they come to the kingdom hall. Maybe a brother or sister rolls them in in a wheelchair. Maybe you've seen some of the circuit assembly. They come in on cots. But they're there, and they still say something to encourage their brothers and to God's honor. You may personally know brothers who have endured problems with health for years, but they're still in the truth. They're still speaking to God's honor. And if we have problems with health, we can do it too, if we put forth the effort. There were some years ago, I visited a brother in the hospital in California, and my two visits on him made quite an impression. When my brothers and I first came to Bethel, our parents moved out to the West Coast. So to see them, we used to get an old car and drive across the country because we wanted to spend our vacation time with our parents. And one year when we were out there, I heard there was a brother in the hospital, a brother that I had been very close to. I thought the world of the man, and I wanted to visit him. So one morning, my brother and I went to this hospital, and I'll say frankly, hospitals and I did not get along too well together when I was younger. I did not look forward to going into that hospital that morning, I'll tell you very frankly. But I wanted to see that brother. So we went in, we found out what floor he was in, what ward he was in, and we got up to the floor where the ward was. It was a tremendous big ward. It was twice the size of this kingdom hall. There were probably a hundred beds in it. When I walked to the door of that ward, we were looking over the beds to see if I could find the brother I was looking for. And he saw us before we saw him. He was over in the corner, and his hand went up, and he waved. And when I followed his hand down, I saw the nicest smile I'd ever seen. We headed across the ward to where he was, and when we got over to his bed, I got the warmest smile I've seen in years. He looked at us, and he said, My, it's glad. It's nice to see you two boys. And in the course of our conversation, I was very much interested in how he was feeling. And I remember asking him how he was feeling. And I remember his answer. He looked at me and he said, you know, I'm feeling pretty good today, thanks. But he said, how was your trip across the country? And he had changed the subject on me and I hadn't really figured out or found out how he was feeling. So a little bit later, I asked him, 
Now, he had been in that hospital for 10 years. And I asked him, after all the years you've been in this hospital, all, after all the tests the doctors have run, what do the doctors say the problem is? I figured wording the question that way, I'd get some kind of answer out of him. And I remember he looked back at me and he smiled. He says, you know, after all the tests they have run on me, the doctors still are not sure what the problem is. But he said, tell me what's new at Bethel these days. And he changed the subject on me. And when I left there a half hour later, I remember very distinctly, I enjoyed my visit. And why? It's because he didn't keep the conversation on the problems he had. He kept the conversation on upbuilding things. Now, a little later that week, before we went back to Bethel, another morning we went to visit him. And I had a couple questions for him this time. So in the course of our conversation, I asked him how he spent his time there at the hospital. I said, now, you've lain in this bed here week after week and year after year. You've been here 10 years. What does a man do? How do you spend your time? And his answer to me was very interesting. He said, frankly, a hospital is not a pleasant place to be, especially at night. And he said the reason why is when they turn off the lights, Everybody can't sleep because of pain. All night long, people groan. Sometimes in the middle of the night, you're about ready to sleep, and somebody screams. Why? Because the pain's so bad, they can't hold it anymore. So he said a hospital is not a very pleasant place to be at night. And he said, I've observed over recent months the orderlies, doctors, and nurses that walk through here. The atmosphere gets to them, and frankly, they look pretty much down in the mouth when they come through here in the middle of the night. So he said, I decided a couple of months ago to take on a little project. And he said, my project is to cheer up the orderlies and the nurses and doctors that walk through here at night. He said, one night uh, a big man came through. His name is Sam. He says he's an orderly here in the hospital. He's been here as long as I have. And Sam came through one night, and he looked pretty bad. His lip, lower lip was hanging down the bottom of his chin. looked like everything went wrong with him. So when he came through the ward, I called to Sam. I said, Sam, you got a minute. And Sam came over to the bed. He said, yeah, what do you want? And I looked up at Sam. I said, Sam, all I want is to see you smile. And he said, I smiled at him. And Sam looked at me twice. And then Sam smiled, too. And he says, Sam, I know it's not pleasant to work in a place like this, but I just want to say, anytime you're coming through here and you're willing to give a smile for a smile, you stop at my bed and I'll smile back at you. Well, he said, now Sam always stops every night when he comes through and we have a nice little conversation. The nurses stop, the doctors do too. But he said, last week Sam came through, he was just as radiant as could be, he was smiling all over the place. While I was talking to Sam, I looked up at him kind of serious. And I said, Sam, I'm afraid I have bad news for you tonight. Sam said, so what do you mean by that? He said, Sam, I think it's not going to be long before you're out of a job. He says, what do you mean? I've been in this hospital 15 years. I got seniority. He says, I know, Sam, but I think you're going to be out of a job. He says, what's the matter with you? Why are you saying that? He says, I'll tell you what it is, Sam. I read a verse in the Bible not so long ago, and it's in the book of Isaiah, and you know what it says? It says, the time will come when no resident in the earth will say, I am sick. And you know what that means, Sam? You're going to be out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what the brother did? He ended up telling him about the new system of things and how sick people are going to begin to get well, and he was witnessing to him all about the new system of things. Now, isn't it interesting? Here's a man who has lain in a hospital bed for 10 years, and he has taken it upon himself to cheer up the people who work in the hospital. Now, what does it illustrate? It illustrates no matter what shape we're in physically, we can speak to God's honor if we choose to. This brother in California did it for years. You may know brothers and sisters here in this area who do it with prolonged problems with health. Job did it 
if we have problems with health, we can do it too. Would you like to turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians 4? There's a verse here that is both encouraging and thought-provoking. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning with verse 16. The verse says, Therefore we do not give up. But even if the man we are outside is wasting away, certainly the man we are inside is being renewed from day to day. For though the tribulation is momentary and light, it works out for us a glory that is of more and more surpassing weight and is everlasting. Now, if you would, look at verse 16 again. 16 is talking about health problems, physical problems, because it says, even if the man we are outside is wasting away. So it's talking about problems with your health. But you notice what verse 17 said. It says clearly, the tribulation is momentary. You know what that means? It's not going to last forever. It's not going to be very long before we're going to be the other side of the great tribulation or Armageddon, and your sick body is going to begin to get well. The tribulation is momentary. It will not last forever. If you're having problems with health, Remember that verse. It can help you hang on and to endure. Your problem will not last forever. It won't be long. Your sick body is going to begin to get well. And that can help us hang on if we have problems with health. Now for a little while, let's talk about problems that come from members of our own family and friends. That can be a very difficult kind of problem to face. It's a problem Job faced. You may remember from your Bible reading that Job had ten lovely children. The Bible says they were beautiful children. And the Bible said as a result of a freak storm, Job lost all ten of his children in death in one day. Now, that's a blow that I think only a parent can fully appreciate. You have children. You love your children. Can you imagine all your children dying in one afternoon? It would be a crushing blow, isn't it so? But that's not all that happened to Job. The Bible said after that, his own brothers turned against him. And then he began to have these problems with his health. And then to cap it off, his wife walked in one day, saw the sorry shape he was in, and said, why don't you curse God and die and get it over with? Job couldn't believe his ears. He counted on more from her. The one woman he counted on to stick with him when things were rough, and she'd make a crack like that. Job looked at her and said, you talk like one of the foolish women. He'd counted on more from her. It's hard when you have problems from members of your own family. But Job had the problem. Might we run into the problem? Yes, we might. Jesus foretold it. Would you like to turn to Luke chapter 12? Verse 52, and you can read what Jesus said about this sort of thing. Luke 12, beginning with verse 52. Jesus said, For from now on there will be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So Jesus said there would be divisions in families. Now, it ought to be appreciated. Uh, Jesus didn't cause the division. But Jesus knew that when people showed appreciation for the truth, there would be divisions in families. And why? Because Jesus knew not everybody would love the truth as much as you do. 
When you heard the truth, you were delighted. You couldn't believe your ears. And a lot of you asked, how come the minister didn't tell me this? Why didn't the priest tell me this? It's all in the Bible. Why didn't somebody tell me this a long time ago? And you were thrilled. But Jesus knew that not everybody would love the truth as much as you did. And that's why he accurately foretold families would be divided. When some embraced the truth and others repelled it. Now, opposition like this can show up when a person first starts to associate with Jehovah's Organization. But opposition like this can show up later, too. And when it, if it comes whether you're new in the truth or have been in the truth for quite a while, it's still a very difficult test of endurance. And the reason why is because the opposition comes from somebody that you love and from somebody whom you need to love you. And another reason why it's tough is because the problem can last a long time. Now, just to illustrate it to you, we might go out in house-to-house work in our preaching activity, and someone in the house-to-house work may be very caustic to you. They may say some very nasty things. Now, this isn't very pleasant to take, but it's happened to us a number of times, and we're used to it. So somebody may be very caustic to us. They may say nasty things. When they get done, they may slam the door. But after they're done speaking their piece, we turn around, we walk off the porch, and we walk down their path, and we turn our back on them. And we see their beautiful lawn, and we look up and we see the blue sky and the white clouds and the pretty trees and the flowering things, and we soon forget all about what they said because we turn our are back on them and walk away, right? But when the problem comes from a member of your own family, that's tough because every time you walk in the front door, you're walking into trouble. You live with it. It comes from somebody you love, somebody you need to love you, and it can last a long, long time, and that's why it's hard. Now, we can endure this kind of trial if we have love. There's a verse in Corinthians where the Apostle Paul said, love endures all things, including this kind of opposition from a member of your family. But the Bible said you got to have strong love for God and for your neighbor. Now the question is, talking about love, who do you love most? Do you love God most or do you love some human your neighbor, your relative most. Who do you love most? I think most of you here this morning will say, frankly, well, I love God most. Okay. If you love God most, then face it. It shows no love of God to quit the truth, to quit your studying, to quit coming to meetings. Because the Apostle John wrote and said clearly, this is what the love of God means, that we keep his commandments. So if you really love God, you're not going to quit coming to meetings because God commanded do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You're not going to quit studying and you're not going to quit sharing in the field service either if your love for God is stronger. But now one other question. This neighbor who opposes, this relative who's giving you a hard time, do you really love that relative? I think most of you will say, yes, I love the relative. That's why it bothers me that they oppose so much. Okay. Have you ever considered that if you really love your relative, it shows no love of the relative to quit the truth? Why? Because if you quit the truth, both of you end up dead at Armageddon. And what kind of love is that for the relative? If you really love the relative, you're going to hang on to the truth. You're going to fight for it. You're going to speak of it tastefully whenever you can, but you're really going to hang on to it and hope there's some love of right in the, love, in the heart of the relative, and it rubs off on him, and he comes around and fa- finally responds before him again. If you really love the relative, you're going to hang on to the truth, 
You're going to be active in doing God's will, and you're going to faithfully recommend it to the relatives, hoping he'll respond, and both of you end up alive when Armageddon strikes. So again, it shows no love of the relatives to quit the truth, and both of you end up dead? That's no kind of love for anybody, is it? Now, it can be very difficult when you face this sort of thing. And talking about difficulties, in the awake some years ago, there was an article about a woman in the Philippine Islands who learned the truth. She ran into quite a severe situation. The account said when she learned the truth about Jehovah, her husband became furious, absolutely furious. He'd come home and many a time he'd yell at her, be anything, but don't be a witness. Maybe you've heard that before, too. But she said in his fury, one night he walked into their bedroom with a loaded revolver, and he swore he was going to kill her, he was going to kill the kids, and he was going to kill himself. And she said, I stood in front of a cursing man with a loaded revolver, and she said, I was terrorized. She said, I prayed, and I prayed to God out loud in front of my cursing husband. She said, it was five of the longest minutes I ever lived in my life. But finally, his cursing began to soften, and the revolver began to go down, and she said, how I thank God nobody got hurt that night. But she said, after that occasion, Whenever she felt she tastefully could, she would tell her husband about the new system of things and what it would be like. And she said she always put her husband in the picture. She'd tell about the new system of things, how pretty it would be, fresh air, clean streams, everything nice. Put him in the picture, things he could do with the kids and with me. She says, whenever I tastefully could, I did it. And she said, you know, after a while, the man quit his yelling. After a while, he started listening. He even asked me a couple of questions one time. And he says, with the passing of time, the man's fury not only stopped, but he agreed to a Bible study. You know, she said, the man got baptized. He's sitting with me in the kingdom hall today. Yeah. How she must thank God that she endured such a tortuous situation. Endurance isn't easy. But if you endure faithful to God, if there's any lo love of right in the other fellow's heart, it may rub off on him and he'll respond. Maybe you've run into situations like that. Maybe you've lived through some situations like that. Maybe you know people who have. Would you like to read a scripture that's encouraging along that line? Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter 2.20. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. Now Peter wrote and said, For what merit is there in it, if when you are sinning and being slapped, you endure it? But if when you are doing good and you suffer, you endure it, this is a thing agreeable with God. Now look at that first sentence again. Peter says, What merit is there in it, if when you are sinning and being slapped, you endure it. Yeah, what merit is there in it? There's no merit in it. You had it coming anyway, didn't you? You were sinning, and you got slapped for it. You had it coming. There's no merit in that. But in the second sentence, Paul says, or Peter says, but if when you are doing good and you suffer, you endure it. This is a thing agreeable with God. Now, I want you to notice something about that verse. That verse did not say that suffering was agreeable to God. God is not pleased with the suffering of anyone, not even those who oppose him. But that verse says, if when you do good, you suffer and you endure it, this is the thing agreeable with God. It's the endurance God's pleased with, not the suffering. So if you're having a hard time from a member of your family, a mate or a neighbor, and you're suffering because of your good course in God's service, and you endure it, at least you can know that 
God observes what's happening to you. He sees your situation, and God is pleased with the course of endurance you are showing. And that may be a real source of encouragement to know that God is watching, God is aware, and God is pleased with your course of endurance. For a few minutes now, let's talk about problems that come from as a result of economic difficulty. Now, the possibility of a drastic economic reversal in this country is all too good. This country has had economic problems for quite a number of years, and a lot of our brothers are having problems hanging on to jobs. So the possibility of economic problems are very good for many. And while we're talking about economic problems, would you like to turn back to the book of Job again? As we take a look at Job, you're going to observe something very beneficial. The Bible indicates that Job was a rich man, but the Bible indicates also that Job was not a materialistic man, and his balance in this helped him to endure a very difficult situation. You may remember from your Bible reading that in Bible times, among those Oriental people, a man's wealth was often measured in the head of livestock he owned, and Job was a very wealthy man. Do you have Job chapter 1? Look at verse 3. Speaking about Job, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, And his livestock got to be 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 spans of cattle, and 500 she-asses, along with a very large body of servants, and that man came to be the greatest of all the Orientals. Now look at this verse again. We want to talk about this for a couple of minutes. It says his livestock got to be 7,000 sheep. I'd like to ask a question. It may sound unusual to you, but I'm asking to see if anybody knows anyway. Has anybody in this group ever raised sheep or been on a farm where they were raised? Anybody? We have several. Very good. I got some questions for you. Can anybody tell me what a good full-grown animal will weigh? About, give or take a little. A good full-grown sheep. What's your guess? Anybody got an educated guess for us on this? Spread it, please. 150 to 200. Big animal. Boy, that's going to make my point all too clear. Yeah. Anybody else? Another estimate on this? Better, please. 60? Well, we got quite a difference here, don't we? I talked to a brother in Pennsylvania about a year ago who's raising sheep now. He said normally they'll run uh, 80, 90 pounds. He said big ones. Will get up to 100, even up to 125. Now, a brother talks about 160. That is a big animal. But let's say, uh, just to take a figure, a good full grown animal weighs about 100 pounds. I asked the brother when you slaughter the animal, take out the waist, the bone, the, the hide, and so forth, how much usable meat do you get? He said you get about 60% usable meat. Okay, that was interesting to me. So if you slaughter a 100-pound animal, you end up with 60 pounds worth of usable meat. Now, I'd like to ask you sisters something, or you brothers, if you know, whoever does the shopping. Can anybody tell me what lamb runs in this part of Florida? Sister back here. You can get ground lamb for a dollar a pound? That's the lowest price I've heard in the eastern part of the country. You're doing all right. Now, leg of lamb you get for a dollar thirty? What do lamb chops run? Anybody know? Sister? She says two thirty nine a pound. Yeah. Okay, well the price is going up. Just to make a calculation. Let's say you had a lamb that weighed 80, 90 pounds. You slaughtered the animal, you ended up with 50 pounds of usable meat. 
Now, just to take a figure for easy calculation, let's say you could buy lamb for a dollar a pound, which is low in price. If you slaughtered an animal and got 50 pounds of usable meat at a dollar a pound, what would that animal be worth? Who's good on the arithmetic? Brother? Fifty dollars. Okay. Now, verse 3 says Job didn't have one lamb. It said he had 7,000 sheep. At fifty dollars a piece, what would they be worth? Brother, please. You shouldn't have changed it. Yeah. Anybody want to verify which one of those two figures is right? Anybody else, brother? What was that? You know, if you calculated on a piece of paper, 7,000 sheep at $50 a piece comes to $350,000. You know what that is? That is over a third of a million dollars. Yeah. And that's the sheep only. And he didn't have sheep only. It goes on to say that he had 3,000 camels, too. Now, I don't know what a camel is worth in this country. <laughs> I guess you don't either, huh? <clears throat> and I don't know if New York Times tells what a camel is worth. I'd like to ask you, in that part of the world, what do people use camels for? Anybody know? How many of you know? What do they use camels for? Brother here? What do they use camels for, you know? Sure, he said it right. They use them to ride on. You know, the way we use cars, we use a car to ride around, right? Over there, they use camels to ride around on. Can you imagine a man owning 3,000 cars? And now you're beginning to get the picture. But I'll tell you something else. They don't only use camels to ride on. If people pack up and move, do you know what they use them for then? Anybody? Do they? Yeah. They use them the way we use a moving truck. They take all their possessions, they pile it on a camel, they use it like we use a, a moving van. Can you imagine a man owning 3,000 moving vans? Okay, now you're beginning to get the picture. Now you can see why the Bible says Job was the greatest of all the Orientals. Job was an unbelievably rich man. Now the Bible says that with God's permission, the devil moved in and he ruined Job. The Bible says as a result of a freak storm, lightning, fire, whatever it was, Job lost all his sheep in one night. A third of a million dollars worth of sheep gone, just like that. And then the Sabaeans moved in, and they got his camel. And then the Chaldeans moved in, and they got his, cat, his cattle. One day, Job was the greatest of all the Orientals. A few weeks later, Job was a pauper. He owned nothing. He sat there on the ground, sick, near unto death. Now, that's quite a reversal, let's face it. Let's apply it to ourselves. I don't think anybody here in the Kingdom Hall this morning considers themselves rich. But the fact remains, all of us have become accustomed to quite a number of material things. Now, when we came in here this morning, I noticed most of you came in a car. So many of you have cars that you own or you're paying for, at least you got a car. And you got a place that you call Well, a howling mob has surrounded the Kingdom Hall. They broke in, they wrecked the place, the Kingdom Hall's going up in smoke. Now, what if you suffered the loss of all material things you enjoy today? Would you hang on to the truth or not? What if the government moved in and said, look, Either you quit preaching or we'll take it all away from you. Would you keep preaching or would you quit? Would you endure 
if you were threatened with the loss of all the material things you now have and enjoy. You know, that's not an unreal possibility. Because that's what happened to our brothers in Cuba. And isn't Cuba only 35 miles off the Florida coast? That's what happened to our brothers in Malawi, in Mozambique, in Hitler's Germany, in Russia. It's happened to a lot of our brothers in a lot of places in the earth, and it might happen to us. If you were threatened with the loss of all your material things, would you endure? It could be quite a test of your endurance, isn't it so? You want to read a verse that's both thought-provoking and encouraging? Turn to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 11 verse 4 says, Valuable things will be of no benefit on the day of fury, but righteousness itself will deliver from death. Did you really see what that verse said? Let's read it again. It says, valuable things will be of no benefit on the day of fury. Do you know that's true? Let me ask you a question or two. When Armageddon strikes, is it going to help keep you alive if you still own a house? Your house isn't going to help you in the slightest when Armageddon strikes, isn't it so? What if you still own a car? Will a car help you get away safe? A car isn't going to help you in the slightest. How about money in the bank? That's going to help you. All of us know it's true. When Armageddon strikes, valuable things will be of no benefit on that day of fury. So if you suffer the loss of certain material things, don't let it bother you too much. It's not going to help you survive Armageddon anyway. And another question or two. The home where you live, it may be a, a lovely home. But do you want to live in that home forever? I doubt it. Yeah. After Armageddon, wouldn't you much rather have one of the brothers build your home? Maybe on the side of town where you'd like to live? Constructed the way you want with a little good quality workmanship? I know many folks have moved to Florida and had homes built for them to their specifications, and when they moved in, they were badly disappointed because of shoddy workmanship and second-rate equipment that was put in that they never expected. Some of our brothers have been very badly disappointed with the quality of the home they ended up with. I don't think you want to live forever in that home, do you? Wouldn't you much rather have the brothers build your home after Armageddon? Some of the homes that some of us live in, <laughs> we'd say good riddance. Isn't it so? Yeah. Don't let it bother you too badly. If you lose some material things, it's no great loss. Remember, valuable things will be of no benefit on the day of fury. It is righteousness that will deliver a man from death. Remember that, and if you lose some material things, don't cry too long, because it's not going to make a whole lot of difference anyway. Now, while we've talked about these things this morning, some of you may remember from your Bible reading that Job endured. Job endured all the severe problems faced. He endured with faithfulness and integrity to God, and he kept on speaking to God's praise no matter what he ran into. But do you know what the final outcome was for Job? If you'd like to read it, turn in your Bible to Job chapter 42. If you've never read this before, you're going to find it very interesting. Job 42 and verse 10. It says, And Jehovah himself turned back the captive condition of Job, when he prayed in behalf of his companion. And Jehovah began to give, in addition, all that had been Job's in double amount. Job ended up with twice as much as he had in the first place. What did he end up with? Look at verse 12. It says, As for Jehovah, he blessed the end of Job afterward more than his beginning, so that he came to have 14,000 sheep, 
6,000 camels, 1,000 spans of cattle, and 1,000 she-asses. He also came to have seven sons and three daughters. Boy, Job made out all right, didn't he? In one congregation, when we read these verses, a little girl leaned over to her daddy and said, Daddy, how come he got twice as many sheep, twice as many cattle, cat, camels, cattle, and asses, but only ten more children? How come not twenty? It was a good question, wasn't it? But you know what daddy did? He leaned down to her little ear and said, Sweetie, when Job gets resurrected and all his children get resurrected, he'll have 20. It was a nice answer, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, why have we talked about these things? It's because of a verse in Romans that you'll remember. It says, all the things written aforetime were written for our instruction, that through our endurance, and through the comfort from the scriptures, we might have hope. If you're one of Jehovah's anointed and look forward to everlasting life in heaven, you will have need of endurance. If you're one of the other sheep and look forward to everlasting life in a beautiful paradise earth here, you too will have need of endurance. All of us will have need of endurance if we want to receive God's gift of salvation. Now, to sum up what we've talked about, I want to ask you four questions, or maybe three. We've talked about problems with health, and we read a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But in that chapter, how long did it say the health problem was going to last? What did the verse say? Sister, back here, please. The Bible says your problem is momentary. It will not last forever. Remember that. It can help you endure. Then we talked about problems that come because of opposition from members of your own family or friends. And we read a verse in 1 Peter 2. And in that verse, what does it say was pleasing in God's sight? Go over here, please. Well, I, I'm going to give you a multiple choice. Did that verse say suffering was pleasing or enduring? Better go ahead. Okay. So I'll give you one more try. In that verse, what did it say was pleasing in God's sight? Endurance is right. Yeah. Then we talked about the loss of material possessions, and we read a verse from Proverbs 11, 4. And in that verse, what did it say would deliver a person from death? Is the danger? Yes, it said righteousness would deliver a person from death. Would you like to turn back to James chapter 5? This is a verse we read about an hour ago. And it may be an hour later that this verse will mean a whole lot more to you than it did the first time we read it. James 5.11 says, look, we pronounce happy those who have endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome Jehovah gave, that Jehovah is very tender in affection and merciful. Yes, with Job, Jehovah was very tender in affection. Jehovah was very merciful and Jehovah was very generous with Job. And you know, with us too, Jehovah will be very tender in affection, very merciful. And Jehovah will be very generous with us too if we maintain endurance like Job did. 